the whole idea, we, we, we forget the audience we're playing for, the concert that it's for. I mean, all that comes. I remember one time I used to I used to do a thing on literature selection. Um, and I remember just lambasting. It was a, a new version of um, Hey Ya by Outcast, And I was I made some flippant comment about quality of repertoire. And, hey -ya. and this guy broached me at the end of the of the clinic. And he said, listen, I'm not going to yell at you or anything. But just I just want to tell you that tune changed my band around. He said, Mike, I can get my kids to play anything. We started playing Hey Ya, and I was able to work things through that tune, and then I was able to expose them to other stuff, and I thought, okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Everything Band, a podcast that features conversations with composers, conductors, and performers of music for winds and percussion. My name is Mark Connor. I'm a composer, and this is episode 36. My guest for this episode is Milt Allen. Before we begin, I'd like to thank all of you for listening and for your support. If you're enjoying these interviews, do me a favor and spread the word with your friends and colleagues. Now, on to the episode. Hi, Milt. Hey, Mark. How are you? I'm well. Thanks for joining me. Absolutely. So I'm really glad we could connect. You were doing some traveling the last yes. month or so. <laughs> yeah. Some exotic locales. Uh, well, yes, as a matter of fact. <laughs> well, we'll get into talking about that. Before we begin, can you introduce yourself for the audience? Sure. My name is uh, Dr. Milt Allen, uh, and I taught for uh, 26 years, both at the element, well, gosh, elementary, middle school, high school levels, and then nine years at the university level. But then uh, a couple of years ago, I founded a 501c3 entitled The Music Gorilla. And that's what I do now. Cool. So you want to talk about The Music Gorilla now and let everyone know what that's all about? Uh, sure. Why not? It, it, uh, so Music Gorilla is, uh, is a music foundation that stemmed from... Uh, uh, being a being a, a director and a university educator and those kinds of things, I've done a lot of traveling and speaking and guest conducting, and uh, I still do those things. But one of the things that I noticed through all those travels is that there's a lot of programs that uh, I had discovered were underfunded um, or just didn't have uh, resources. I mean, just somebody to come in and, and work with them, so underserviced. And so a big part of what the Music Gorilla does now is seeks out and works with programs that are underfunded or underserviced, just to give a different music perspective, if nothing else. I see. And so what kind of services do you offer? Well, I mean, there's all the, I'll, I'll say the traditional kinds, right? Um, I mean, there's, of course, coming in and rehearsing, uh, you know, the guest conducting, that kind of thing with groups. But beyond that, I also do cross-curricular things. I, I, I think it's interesting that as music educators, oftentimes we would go into schools and we'd only work with the musical groups. Well, you know, our society is kind of at war with the arts and with music. And I think one of the most important things that we can do is reach a wider audience with what we do. So, for example, when given the opportunity, I may go into a school, work with their uh, bands, possibly their orchestras, and then I'll do cross-curriculum presentations. Um, for example, when I was just in Alaska, we did a whole two-week thing on uh, poetry and songwriting and created some original works. Or it might be a, a cross-curricular presentation that deals with math or music and history. Or ways that even mu use music to illuminate any instructor's curriculum. Um, so that's one of the one of the things that uh, that we do with that's so a little bit little bit different. I like that. I like that idea of finding your own niche, something that's a little bit different than what the normal services are offered. Yeah, yeah. and I think that's important. You know, in a way, you're kind of finding what your your special thing is that it differentiates you. Yeah, I mean, part of the whole of the whole thing is this idea of waging music, and the thing that's important to me is I. I really have issue with this idea of highbrow music, lowbrow music. Um, and I think we need to approach it as nobrow music. And I think we need to eliminate this stigma of one music is better than another. I think, I think any student or, or, or any person in any organization, you know, we can't define for them what music does for them. But we can use, certainly use it as a common language. And everybody speaks different languages. So... Um, part of what I do and part of where my interests are is a, is a wide variety of music. But to be able to go into any kind of situation and try to form a connection through music, through whatever genre, I think is, is imperative because then a musical conversation can take place. Yeah, I think that I like that concept of no brow. The way I look at it is that a rising tide lifts all ships and that we're all part of the same same art form, whether we're Taylor Swift or we're at the very tip of the avant-garde spear. We're still working towards a common goal. Well, it's yeah. I mean, it's it's fascinating to me that uh, you know, having grown up in a in a part of classical atmosphere, uh, d doing you know what we do, 
why is it we struggle to get people to their concerts beyond our parents, but yet a rock concert is going to draw 50,000 people? I think there's validity to that. And I'm not talking just about appealing to the masses either, right? Because the people who are at those concerts love them. They enjoy them. And it doesn't matter if it's a rock concert or a string quartet concert. The idea is music is reaching people. And I think that there's, when we start putting up, you know, structures and frameworks that, that place a value, a, a right or wrong on a music, man, that's not what being a musician is about. You know, I think there's there's good and bad musics in any genre, but I think there's also a lot of things to learn <laughs> from from studying different genres of music. Absolutely. You know, uh, and, and just a, an aside to that too, Mark. You know, this idea of in the United States, we're very geared toward a couple things. One of those things is we we often like to define our musicians. Uh, take the educational process. You're a vocalist. You're an orchestral player. You're a band person. You know, that's. We're one of the only places in the world that does that, to my knowledge. I mean, and but we're also great at the ensemble concept. But along with that is if you look at the way we teach music, it's very performance oriented, right? Always rehearsals for one performance um, or maybe marching band show that we spend thousands and thousands of dollars on. And then we have our competitive show. And sometimes, and this will ruffle little feathers, we use the right bud, buzzwords to say that it's educational, you know, We've really got to be careful there. But the idea of of a performance-based curriculum versus what's wrong with participatory music. And I think it's something that we oftentimes overlook. People who want to participate in music just to play because of how it makes us feel, because of how it made any of us feel when we when we first started. I think it's kind of gotten lost in the in the trample, so to speak. Music should be something that's just valuable and and then the feeling that you get from being in it. I know. As a young person, that was a part of my identity. It gave me a place to be. And Mm -hmm. it still gives me a place to be. I still wake up every morning with a community around me of musicians. Right. And so I think that's really valuable. I'm I'm interested about this idea that you just mentioned a little bit ago. And I want to apply it to the band community. And I was speaking with someone about um, early band music and how in the 19th century and even in the early part of the 20th century, transcriptions of popular tunes, of popular opera arias, this was what the bands were playing, the Susan Marches. Um, do we run the risk in the band world of becoming too elitist? Oh, I think we've already, I think we're there. There is a problem with egos and kingdom building in, in our profession. You know, I, I remember at one time uh, in, the, in the early 2000s, there was, you know, a big push as an example for CBDNA to to go to Carnegie Hall and to have the CBDNA convention there. And the idea was we want to erase that orchestral paradigm of elitism and the fact that it was becoming uh, a historical archive. And the response wasn't, I think, what the university committee had hoped that it would be. Um, it wasn't the big show and, and coming out party, you know, kind of like it was. Um, now, that said, part of the of the role of our universities is to push the boundaries of what, uh, you know, the, the wind band medium can do especially now that we've seen such a decrease in our military bands, which has been a, a terrible thing because they were kind of the, the, really the sacred keepers of the band flame. But that, that, that mantle has now shifted to the universities. But, but by and large, I think that, that during this whole time, we've, we've become elitist. We like to talk about our composers. We like, to talk, we like to substantiate which pieces we think are the most important repertoire. And again, I think all those things are important, but I think that they have to be taken within – context. And I think sometimes we've done this at the alienation of other genres and other styles of of music. It's interesting because, you know, the band world isn't just, it's not a monolithic thing. And, you know, the junior high bands play one type of music, community bands play another type of music, university bands play another type. But I don't think it's, I think the band world still provides the place where new music is most vibrant. There's no question. And almost to an extreme, we're willing to play anything. (laughs) And there's a lot of churn in, in at every level of the band. Yeah. You know, there's that constant, you know, the catalog every year of new pieces is, is really vast. Oh, it's, it's, it's enormous, you know, and, and talking with, with Mike Sweeney and, and some of the other guys who are involved at that level, it's just fascinating to hear how many pieces of new music are written each year. And then of course the argument pops up is how many of those are credible pieces? Well, who determines what credible is, you know, and then, uh, um, uh, uh, just merchandising comes into play, so to speak. Um, but the bottom line is you're absolutely right. I mean, 
the cool thing about the band world is we're willing to take a chance. I think more so than any other genre, we're willing to take a chance. We're willing to try new things. We're willing to give somebody a shot. And that is something I, I really like about, about the genre. Yeah. Outside of the very avant-garde chamber communities that exist around the country. Yeah. The band is the, where the most new music is being performed. Well, and, and, and well, Hollywood and film, if we consider that classical, but um, it's interesting that you talk about that because there, there's like over a thousand pieces every year, new pieces released. You know, actually well more than a thousand that come out every year. But when you take into account, you know, the major publishers who are not taking on new composers, because that's not what it's about. Um, and the fact that you've, you've got major, understandably, you've got, you've got major companies that are able to push certain pieces. But what about that one composer who has that one piece or only has a couple pieces, but it's a great piece? exposure how do you how do you find out about that now again I'll, the internet's a great thing and that's one of the ways we dig but where there's there's lots of places where there's great music but on one hand it's tougher to find on the other hand yay we've got the internet we've got word of mouth and we've got you know facebook and we've got social media that we can communicate with each other on which is what we need to do when we hear a piece that we like but even there the the range is limited facebook has all sorts of algorithms that limit how many people see things because they're one, right. they're they're encouraging so they're encouraging someone like me a composer to pay for an ad and they'll artificially put limits on how many people will see something that i post right and so i run into that all the time with this as i try to market this it's why i ask at the beginning of the podcast please spread the word you know because people need to tell other people otherwise you know they won't find out find out about it right you yeah. know i need to get i need to to send an email to stephen bryant or someone like that the BCM guys who, who made it sort of as self-published, but yeah, I made a conscious decision when I started to, re to write band music a few years ago to go with a publisher and to go with the commercial publication, because I didn't think I could give myself that exposure. The BCM guys are old friends. I knew um, Newman and Steve and Jim Bonnie were, were, were old buds way back. We hit it off back when they first started making the things and Eric would come in and, and the way that they had set that up, not to speak for them, but was very calculated. But Eric already was established. Yeah, sure. The corporate medium. And that was a big, big part of that. And they purposely chose to self-publish to retain the rights, not only artistically, but just in terms of, of financially. But what they traded for that was, besides having Eric's help, was they, they purposely tried to cultivate a cult of personality, something different, something new, something that was an alternative to what was to what was out there. And they did it at a time, both, uh, you know, when social media was breaking um, and other things were happening. I mean, just the time was right that they were able to kind of parlay that. Now, that said, it was still really, really hard for those guys to, to do that. Oh, yeah. But what sustained them was as they became even better composers and started getting their things played and networking. Um, I think that, that what, what the guys did is actually, in some ways, a great roadmap for aspiring composers. Mm -hmm. because there was no brass ring. There was no easy way. Um, but they would try to retain as much as they could and struggled with the complete ownership of their own music. Yeah. No, I love the way they did. And I love the way they went and they engaged on message boards and they had their forums and, you know, it. To me, they made it very personal with everyone that they came across. Yep. I, yep. Yeah, I, I needed to 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 get some one of them on quickly. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's an interesting thing. I was mentioning that you know when I first came back to this, I wasn't a band composer. I got my doctorate, and I was going to write chamber music, write orchestral music, and I had written a band piece while I was at uh, a doctoral student, mm -hmm. and it sat in a drawer for about a decade, <clears throat> and I played it for a friend of mine, actually, Demandre Thurman, the euphonium player. And he was like, well, you know, I want to play this with Samford and you should send it to a publisher. And so I sent it to Walter Cummings at Grand Mesa mm -hmm. and it was published immediately after 10 years of just collecting dust. And I, I feel like that's a really good piece. And I feel like it's getting more and more performances as my profile grows from being published through commercial publishers. And so I wow. think there's, um, yeah, it's a really, it's a really difficult question. It's one that I've grappled with over the past couple of years, like how much of it on my own and how much of it with help. And is the trade-off worth it or not? And I think every composer has to answer this question on their own. Yeah, and, and you know, it's, I hate to say it, but you can't rule out what the ultimate goal is. You know, is it income? Because as you know, as a composer, when you're only making 10% royalties when you're going to a company, man, you got to write a lot of tunes. Yep, you sure do. <laughs> um, and this is another way that, our, that I think that our, our industry has changed. And, and again, I understand it. Um, 
But, you know, I, I, when I was younger, I still kind of remember a time when composers could write what they would want. But it's very different now because composers need to write, A, what's popular, but also the way these contracts read, you're going to write so many tunes at a certain grade level in certain keys because that's what we know that directors will buy. Now, that's understandable, but there's also that slippery slope of what, a, what about a composer who writes something because they want to? that may or may not appeal. Right. Of course, that's where commissions come in. You know, that's where if we truly give a composer, you know, free reign, although the reality is, you know, when we when we commission a composer, it's usually because we like something that they wrote and we want it to kind of sound like that. Right, exactly. <laughs> thing. But um, so again, it's it's an interesting, it's an interesting and difficult, difficult conundrum. You know, for the yeah. I don't know if there's, there's a right answer. Everyone's got their own path. You know, I've chosen to subsidize my composing through teaching and um, other people try to go on their own. And, and I think if you can establish yourself and can be self-published, then more power to you. But that's a yeah. really tough row to hoe. Right, right. Yeah. Um, and so I have nothing but respect for those who do that. And um, but, you know, I don't also discount what I do. I kind of like writing junior high band music. I, I like it. I like, I like the way it sounds and I like the feeling that kids get from it. And I like the reactions that junior high kids have. I just, yeah. Oh yeah. I'm unapologetic about it. <laughs> yeah, no, it's great. It's, you know, I think there's a real misnomer. I think the hardest thing in the world to do, and I haven't written much, but is in talking with my composer buddies is writing for young bands. Oh man. To, to, to compose something that's really interesting and maintains the interest of a 14 year old. I mean, come on, man, that's not an easy task to do or 12 year old, you know? Um, and, and that rep, especially that grade one to grade three, or grade two and a half is so, so, so important that, that those learning kind of literature things that, that hold a kid's interest. Yeah, no. And it's hard. It's, it's hard to write it. I, I, I feel comfortable in that range. Actually, I feel more comfortable writing a grade one than I do writing a grade five. Wow. And that's hard to do. You know, I, I like the restrictions because I've, absor I've sort of absorbed them into what I do. And so uh, I've sort of, my style now almost reflects that because I yeah. internalize those restrictions. Uh, and, and somehow the writing a grade five, and I have one that I, I'm planning to write, it's daunting to go back to that feeling of having every possibility open. It's like Stravinsky said, those restrictions open creativity. Yeah. Because when, you're, when you have every color on the palette, you don't really have anything. Well, but, you know, the other side of that is if you walk through that forest enough, right, you're going to trust your own instincts. Sure, sure. Of course. I, I, you know, and you're comfortable with, with, with the level that, you, that you're writing now, so it stands to reason. But I would wager if you spent time, I mean, that's kind of where the, the wheelhouse was. Shoot, man. You know, it's just kind of like, I remember talking to Steve I one time on an interview, the great guitarist, and I remember talking with Steve about just what he practices, because I was curious when you're Steve Vai, what he practice? Uh, yeah. You know? He, he, first of all, he only practices the things that he does well, which I thought was an interesting response. Um, but the point was, it gets to the point where he has such command, like any instrument, has such command that there's absolutely no thinking involved. And I think to an extent, you know, maybe that's what, what the composer shoots for at any level or any medium that they're writing for. You get to that point where the, the, the craftsmanship, you, you can pursue pure artistry, and then the craftsmanship follows easier. Because you're just used to that area that you're musically living in. Mm -hmm. All right, this has really been interesting, Milt, but I'm afraid that we've got a little inside baseball here. <laughs> and so um, let's kind of back up a little bit. Let's go back to the beginning of you and let's talk about your origin. So, what's your origin story? <laughs> My origin story. So, I grew up in the, uh, in the mecca of music of Kansas, and I grew up in a place called Salina, Kansas. And uh, I knew by seventh grade that I wanted some way to make music my life. Um, Mel Harrington was my junior high band director. And then when I got to uh, high school, um, uh, I had a, a couple folks who were my band directors. Gail McMillan was the most influential. And Gail ended up doing amazing things uh, uh, with KMEA and for music education in Kansas. But for me, he just gave me carte blanche. And knowing in middle school that I wanted to go into music in some way, and then all the opportunities that Gil gave me had a profound impact on, on what I wanted to do musically and education and performance and all those kinds of things. So uh, my parents never went to college. And um, when I told my dad I wanted to go to college and that I wanted to be uh, going to music, it was one of the biggest arguments that we had ever had. Um, we're talking about a, a very, you know, dad was raised very poor. 
and you need to go into business in some way. But my mom was hugely supportive and dad went along with it as long as I could get scholarships and <laughs> pay for my education. So I went to a school for a couple of years in Kansas and then decided I wanted something a bit more rounded. So packed up everything and went down to North Texas and um, finished my undergrad there and then got my, my uh, first job in the, in the Parkway School District. So I have to ask, did your father eventually come around? You know, it was really funny, Mark, that when I got my first gig, this is so strange. When I got my first gig, my dad saw the school and it's a you know, very large, beautiful school. And he looked, me, looked at me and said, you're going to be OK, uh, which I didn't really understand. Um, but, yeah, suddenly everything was going to be he saw that I was going to be a paycheck. I mean, to my father, music was what you did literally on the weekend. You plug in the radio and everybody would gather around it. Now, how's somebody going to make a living doing that? You know? So, but yeah, that was kind of the start of everything. That attitude's still pretty prevalent. Yeah, he, so far so good. No, I mean, in society, we, we still have this notion and people still say it, the starving artist. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, and uh, I think the starving, yeah. Um, although I can say now I am with, with this, this 501c3 literally, but uh-huh. yeah. And, and that's, that's, you know, that was the, the misconception I think that he dealt with. So those early experiences, is there anything from those early years that you're carrying with you today that are lessons that you still use when you teach? I think, um, I think that the sense of, of connection with the person that you're, that you're working with, um, as strange as that sounds, I mean, m- music first and foremost is not about a teacher-student relationship. It's about a mentor relationship. And I think remembering that uh, has something that's always stayed with me in a a larger sense. I mean, the fact that we're dealing with human beings um, and we're we're, we're dealing with something that to me is a very sacred art. Um, And then of course, there's the pragmatic things of just, you know, watching how things were were structured, looking at how concepts were taught, uh, building systematically, establishing a foundation. Um, and, and really learning how things work at that point. And those, those things really struck me early. And again, uh, let alone just the power that music had. Um, but those were, were things that, that set me on certain paths from, from there on out. And also just a thirst to look at things a different way. Um, why do we do things that way? I mean, why does it work? Or how, why do people respond to music like they do or a teaching technique like they do? Yeah, it's interesting because I'm thinking about what you're doing with Music Gorilla, and I'm thinking about that comment you just made. And then I think about our Western culture and the way we've created the school system that's sort of different than we've learned music for centuries. We've suddenly changed it now. And I'm just wondering if you have any sort of, this is a very vague question. I know I'm throwing out this sort of very nebulous kind of concept, but if you have thoughts about how we can sort of heal that and get back to a more personal relationship, I guess, in teaching music. Yeah, uh, and I think that's a real trick because one of the things that I've seen more and more when I go out, and especially I've seen this when I've, when I've gone in to conduct some honor groups, is that there seems to be a, a predisposition, a preconception about what catchphrases the, the conductor says or how they approach the group and this, this kind of group mentality. But I, I think first and foremost, I think we have to remain in touch with why we got into music in the first place. And I think that that's a lot harder said than or a lot harder done than said because you know one thing that was ex- extremely liberating for me is actually when i left the paradigm of university teaching i walked away from that just that whole thing because i no longer had to drink everybody's kool-aid and it was interesting because when you step back and away from from those restraints and really look at what you believe in and really think about why you got into music you realize that maybe somewhere you strayed and i think when we're dealing with our students now when we're dealing with our ensemble members now I think we really need to remember first and foremost what it is about music that, that put us in front of those people there. And that's the, that's the first thing. I think we need to understand that everyone is going to bring their own concepts and approaches to how they're going to play, and all those are welcome because that's what makes every single group unique. That's why when our seniors leave, you know, our high school band will never be the same. Well, no, it won't be, but you're going to have these cool experiences that these freshmen have coming in. That's going to make it, you know, that unique. Um, in our educational environment, I think we always need to remember the old adage that our students don't ter- care how much you know until they know how much you care. And I think the teaching that we do off of the podium is every bit as important um, on the podium. But remembering that we're dealing with not robots, but, but humans on the podium. 
Yeah, no, I think that's true. Whether it's you're on the podium or in a classroom, you know, I see that too. You know, I spend lots of time in my music theory and oral skills classes, just talking about life, answering their questions, just dealing with things that don't relate to music theory. Cause there's so much more about being a college student and being a musician than just those notes and just those drills. And it doesn't mean that we discount standard and there's right. a misconception. Right. You know, we, we still have our standards that we want our students to aspire to, but you know, part of our job in an educational environment, in my opinion, is, is very, is very holistic. And I think part of what we're doing is modeling what it is to be a human, what it is to be a musician. Even if that person's going to go into basket weaving or hamster tossing, they can still see how we approach life and approach people as humans. And I think in, in, in this day and age where there's an even more disconnect because of social media and electronic media, I think those relationships are super important. And those are the ones that are based, that are the basis of making music. I remember I was jogging one time with Libby Larson uh, when I had her at Eastern, and we got into a conversation about the value of the ensemble in the university or the school setting. And to me, one of the most important and coolest things about the ensemble in those settings is, is a forced vulnerable, a forced vulnerability. Um, we have to be vulnerable to be in an ensemble. There has to be give and, give and take. Now, I, I realize, and I don't want to sound like I'm making that the more important thing than the, than the beauty of music itself, because I, I have an issue with all of the secondary things sometimes that we try to substantiate music with. We need to substantiate music because it's music. But to be a musician is to be vulnerable. And it's to be vulnerable in an ensemble to other people, to other ideas, to other nuance, to other phrases, to other musics. Um, which gets back at the heart of relationships and and the and the basis of teaching as well as making music. Yeah, that's really great, Mel. All right, Mel. So, can you tell the listeners about your career as a band director? Where what what stops did you make, and what were your programs like at those stops? Um, sure. So, um, had the undergrad, got out of North Texas, and uh, a school district had called and said that North Texas to my advisor and said we're looking for somebody with experience. That's a brass player. He said, well, I got this student that's going to be graduating that doesn't have any formal experience, has done lots of clinics and stuff and drum corps and things, and is a woodwind player, but you should take a look at him. And so that's how I ended up getting the gig at, at Parkway South High School. And Parkway South High School at that time was a school of about 2,000, and they had one band, and it was, I think, 50 or 60. And um, so it was a rebuilding program. And um, so I jumped up there and was... You know, thought I knew it all and immediately rubbed lots of feathers wrong. Here's this, you know, guy who got just graduated from, from college and gets what could be a retirement gig, right? Um, so I jumped up there and uh, was actually very fortunate. We, we started with a smaller program. And by the time uh, I left there, we had, gosh, uh, uh, a couple concert bands, solid concert bands, a really fine top band. I can't remember the numbers. Um, we got our jazz band into the curriculum. Uh, we had some after school things going. I mean, the, the program really became vibrant. In fact, uh, Chris Becker is still at Parkway South and Chris does a marvelous job. Um, and Chris had come there as, uh, as an associate director when I was there. So I went from there, I went and got a master's, came back and um, kind of a, a weird story. When I came back, uh, I, w- I, wa- I had a chance to get Fred Finnell in for, uh, for a week uh, residency, right? And it was going to cost $2,000 to get Fred Fennell at my high school for a week. And the principal at the time wouldn't support it. However, the principal would give several thousand more than that toward the marching band. And being young and stupid, I voiced my very definite opinion on that and realized after, uh, and this was just before I left for my master's and came back, that you know, probably we need to part ways. So what I did is became a fixer for a couple of years and kind of helped some of the elementary programs and things. And then I thought, well, I'm gonna get away from all the politics. So I went to this small school district, Orchard Farm School District, which is in St. Charles County, right on the river. Very poor school district, uh, but had a wonderful administration. And for me, professionally, personally, spiritually, it was a low point of, of my career. And two or three years into that, I can't even remember now, um, I had a student that was murdered by another student. and. I quit teaching because I felt that uh, I, I just couldn't be a part of an accessory. I couldn't believe that I had, you know, was part of a school that in my mind had contributed to, to this seventh grade clarinet player losing her life. And the reason for that is we had had meetings about her killer 
who was also a 16-year-old who I saw in detention all the time. And um, anyway, so I left teaching for, for uh, I, uh, I thought forever I was done. Um, when I came back, I, I had been doing some clinics and things when I was at Parkway South. I started doing some guest conducting in clinics and that kind of stuff. And then when I left Orchard Farm, backed away, gone for a year, realized, you know what, we spend all this time holding the baton only to realize it's really the other way around. So I went back to Kansas and I um, checked, uh, there's a school there called Sacred Heart. And they had one time I had a super band program and I went and talked to the principal and and uh, they were looking for somebody and had seen my resume and all the things that I had done to that point were very kind and didn't think I was serious. And I said, nope, I am. Um, I'm a racehorse. I don't give pony rides. I'd love to build a program. So I went in there. I had seven kids um, in the high school. And um, the high school was about 110. And the junior high was about, I think, 80. And we started with a little over 20 in the junior high and seven in the high school. Uh, and then when I left, I think four or five years later, when I got the call from OSU, um, our high school band was up to 72 and our uh, junior high band was, I think, up to 72. Uh, we had an active commissioning series. We had a guest composer uh, program. We brought people in. Um, we did all kinds of performances, uh, started the jazz program, started the concert program, had a parade band happening and just all kinds of cool stuff. And again, was doing more guest conducting and clinicking and all that kind of stuff. Um, got the call from Ohio State. Oh, and I should mention back when I was at, uh, 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 this was a formative thing for me. When I was at Parkway South, I had gotten involved at that time, was trying to do conductor symposiums um, because I thought I was going to be the world's greatest, you know, next world's greatest, youngest conductor, stupid ego thing. And But one of the things I got into was, was really earth uh, or, or a huge change for me. Calgary, University of Calgary had the Calgary Conducting Diploma Program at that time. And what they would do is three weeks where basically you didn't slept, didn't sleep. And they pulled in people like Fred Fennell and Tim Ranch and Frank Battisti and Craig Kirchhoff. And you had access to these people for a week at a time. And that was extremely uh, an influential time to me to work with those minds and to pick their brains. Um, so I was very fortunate in being able to work with, with those people and some of those relationships maintained even, even later on. Um, one of the coolest things that Fred Fennell ever said to me was, you know, I think Percy would have liked you. I'm not quite sure how to interpret that totally, but I took it as a compliment. So I went to Ohio State and uh, got the doctorate there and did some more university teaching in what little spare time I had at a couple of universities that were around there doing some sabbatical fill-ins. And then got the job at Eastern Illinois. When I went to Eastern Illinois, it was in shambles. Um, there was one band, and the marching band was the absolute worst marching band that I had ever, collegiate band that I had ever seen in my life. And um, when I left four or five years later, at one point, we had gone from one band to four concert bands. We got Barry in there. Our, our athletic bands were rocking and rolling. And Barry was also doing a great job with our, our second band, our symphonic band. Um, we had a guest composer program, a guest music educator program, an active commissioning series, middle school honor band, high school honor band. I mean, we had all this stuff just firing. And then they started to dismantle the program because they had gotten rid of the department chair. Um, and that was at about the time that Ohio State called. So by then I was doing things for, for Hal Leonard and also for, for Jupiter Instruments. Um, jumped over to, got the doctorate again. I had come back, I was at Eastern, sorry. And then I got another call uh, from Ohio State, asking if I would fill in as the visiting associate director of bands. Um, so while at Ohio State, I uh, was a part of creating the, the, the fourth audition band, the uh, Collegiate Wins there, and also I instituted the middle school honor band program that they now enjoy. Wow. Okay. So that there's a lot there to talk about. Um, if you don't, if you don't mind, I'm going to rewind a little bit and go no, back. No, please, please. Basically, it boils down to this. I've some would say that I've kind of been to the top of the mountain. Right. I mean, you know, here I was potentially at, at, a, at that level. And I, I can honestly say I look at that and thought this isn't what I thought it was going to be. The only reason I ever got the doctorate mark was because I felt compelled to get it. And that if I had an opportunity to help shape the future of music education by training teachers and I need to do that. My experience was that wasn't quite what went on. So but that's me. Yeah, we all have our own experiences about it. I. I I left a job as a, as a high school teacher and I, ha I was at a private school as well that I started out my first day I had 12 kids in my band 
There you go. Yeah. And uh, I left that and I ended up getting a doctorate in composition. And I often wonder if I had stayed in that job, what my career would look like now, or if I had gotten a doctorate in say education or conducting what my career would look like. And, you know, I think we all find our own path. We talked about this with composers and, and I think that's what music is. And that's when you get in your, through your career, we all have an, our own journey and it looks different for everybody. No right or wrong. No, there isn't a right or wrong. It's the Robert Frost poem, right? You can't look down the woods. Once you go down your path, you know, you're, you're down. That's right. Yeah. My father used to always tell me you can't, you you never make a bad decision because you can't relive your decisions. Right. All right. So I want to talk, go back and I want to talk about your experience at Sacred Heart, because to me, this is really an exceptional thing. You mentioned that the high school had 110 students. Yeah. And your band had 70. Uh, yeah. 72, I think when I left. Yeah. So you were near 70% of the school was in the yeah. band. Yeah. Okay. So now I have to ask the question, how, how does this <laughs> happen? How did you do that? Cause a lot of people would like to know that. Well, parents, I, I think the simplest reason is kids are drawn to quality. This is true. You know, to be honest, kids are drawn to quality. You, you can't, you can't pull the, the wall over a high school student or a middle school student size. And I think kids will jump through hoops to do what it is they want to do. And the way that that program was constructed I knew that going in that we had a tremendous problem with credibility, of course, in the school, but outside of the school as well. I knew to change the perception within the school was going to take a little bit longer. So what I did first was work on changing our perception and thereby our support from the community. And so what I initially did was try to create experiences that were what I would call real music experiences, where our students were we're having to play in front of people that were not their parents, but were regular crowds or regular people that also combined exposure in the community so that they would see that there's a change happening at our school, but also raising the quality and the expectation of, of the music making that the students were doing. You know, the first thing I did was had a very honest conversation with the students. And I still remember it cracked me up. I remember I'm looking at these seven students and I said, okay, so. Um, uh, how do you guys think that the, that the school views you guys? How do you, how do you think that they view your music making and how do they view the band? And they all looked at each other and one kid looks at me straight in the eye and says, well, they think we suck. And I said, okay, okay. You know, I'm trying to be positive. No, no problem. Okay. Now, but, but what do you guys think? What do you guys think about your band program? And they looked at each other and the kid looks back at me and says, well, we suck. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that was so awesome <laughs> because we didn't have to deal with the fact that they had the wrong expectations, right? Mm -hmm. So the two things that were awesome right off the bat were they had a pretty real sense about where they were. And the second thing was they were still there. They were still there. I had come in a month before I started and we did a big talk with any interested parents or students about the program. And I analyzed, I had PowerPoint. Here's what the program is. Here's what I'm proposing. Here's what it's going to take to reach our goals. And for the most of the parents who saw that, they wanted their kids to be in, but the kids didn't want to work that. Um, so again, we, I set a musical standard early and then created these opportunities that essentially forced my kids to be performers and learn what that's about, but also instilling in them a sense of, of quality of their music making. Now, when I'm saying music making, geez, Mark, the first thing we did was work on four 30 second timeouts. That's what we worked on. And then I supported those with a keyboard drum machine. That's how we started. And it took us forever to make those four 30 second timeouts and the school fight song sound decent. But once we could do that, and once we could play a really great rendition of the Star Spangled Banner, man, that, that got us out. That's what got us going. And I had established a musical standard. Yeah. So you, you basically, what you're saying is you set up a situation where they could be successful. Absolutely. Right. Whatever that was. Yeah. Right. You know, I, I had a, I was really blessed when among the 12 students I had, one of them was a, sa a junior saxophone player uh -huh. and he ended up going on to the Berkeley school of music. He was oh. an exceptional player. In fact, my second year, I took the kids up to the Reno jazz festival and he won best soloist. Whoa. In Reno. <laughs> yeah. Nice. So he yeah. was exceptional. So I leaned on him. And in fact, the kids as adults now, they're all in their thirties. Yeah, I spoke with one. She said, well, you know, we were a little jealous of him, <laughs> but, but I leaned on him. I, you know, I, I, I wrote arrangements for the band where basically he could solo 
like at yeah. football games or basketball games. And it sort of helped raise the stature. And I love that, that idea of just doing something of quality to attract more quality. Yeah. And, and the thing is, once, you know, the, the beginning of a change of paradigms, like that one of the things that's so important early on is, well, first of all, I disagree when they say like you take over a program and some folks will say, well, you know, it's going to take, you know, four years, you got to get those kids out of there before. Right, right. I think that's a bunch of crap. If you don't establish your expectation in that first year, you're sunk. You're sunk. And I think uh, establishing musically what I wanted, and also in terms of just the expectations of, of in this case, the band, that was a, a huge moment and a huge time because we knew from the get-go, here's what the expectation is. Here's what we want to happen. And that was, that was crucial and making all that come alive. Mm-hmm. So let me ask you, let's say you're a young teacher or maybe, maybe a mid-career teacher and you take over at a, an established program and you know what you need to do and you know what the kids need to do. How do you deal with the repercussions that are going to come from students? It's going to happen. Um, I think it's important if you go into a new program that you understand as much about the community, about the student and the history of the community, about the student population about the history of that band program is absolutely possible. And I spent a lot of time doing that because I, I want to know the type of kids and the community that I was dealing with. I think you have to understand too, that there's, I hate to say it, but there's going to be some casualties when there's a paradigm shift. It's just going to happen. You're always going to have students who are going to always be loyal to that old director and they're just not going to see it any other way. Um, but the, the, the thing is we have to establish our standard. And we can be supportive of kids um, and encourage kids to be a part of it, have our door open and talk to them. But we can't be afraid, at a, again, a paradigm shift of a new program or when we're in a new program to make that, make that change. Um, I also think it's important to talk to parents, let them know what the discussion is about beforehand, let your administration know. Everything that I did, for example, at Sacred Heart, I started with talking to my administration. I'm thinking about doing this. I'm thinking about going this direction. What do you think? And then I would talk to my music boosters and say, here's what I'm looking at. Here's, I mean, so that, that, that safety net of administration, parents, and students, just like we should be doing in our classrooms, was established. So then everybody was on board with knowing that the direction that we were headed. Now, I think we have to remember, too, that especially with our, with our music boosters and even sometimes our administration, we're in charge of the musical vision and the music curriculum. We make the educational decisions. Our boosters do not. Our boosters support the educational direction. They don't set it. But <laughs> we need to make sure that we include those folks in the conversation. Um, it's hard. You know, that first job is hard and, and learning these things. Uh, you know, you just have to be tough. Yeah. I had a, a, my college music education professor had these, these sayings that he gave us all. And one of the things he said is you have to be able to take it. You have to love the students enough to take it. And there are those moments, you know, as well as I do, where the students, they'll give it to you. Yeah, the, 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 I think one of, the, one of the biggest misconceptions I had is I went into the job thinking that I was supposed to know it all. And that's not the case. You know, our, the, our students will teach us a lot, even subtly, if we're, if we're vulnerable enough to be open to it, <laughs> you know. And then you'll learn that difference also between wars and battles. Yeah, exactly. I didn't, I didn't have that lesson really well learned when I first started. Oh man, I didn't. I didn't. Gee, I had a lot, I had a lot of battles that I I thought were the hill worth dying on and boy, in retrospect, they should just let it go. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. Letting go is not the same thing as giving up. No, no, no. Right. You have to know where to fight and where not to. And that only comes from experience. Yep. Yep. And we've already talked a lot about sort of practical things and practical advice, but if there's one more hard-earned lesson, the one thing that maybe you wish you could spare someone else from learning, do you have any, any sort of thoughts about that? Well, I got a couple. I mean, if you're not living, you're dying. You know, if you're not, if you're not growing, if you're not getting smarter, um, I think when we stop trying new things and experiencing new things and learning new things, we wither. You know, that's just the, the nature of what we are. But I think, and this, the, the other thing I'm going to mention is no secret. I think, the, I think more than ever, one of the biggest things that we struggle with is the idea of balance, um, personal, professional, you know, and our own mental health. Um, that's tough. And I think that 
teachers, especially in the secondary schools and, and primary schools, more than ever are faced with challenges that continue to get worse. And we have to understand that we're human beings. And we need to remember that if we're no good, whatever that may mean, then we're no good for our students. Right. That's how we began our conversation. I just talked to a counsel a student that same advice. Yeah. You know, they I tell mean, us when we get on the airplane, put the oxygen on yourself before you put it on others. Absolutely. You know, there's this misconception. I remember I used to hear about saying, you know, what we do is not who you are. Well, I disagree. If you're a musician, it's exactly who you are. You, we can, we're artists. We can't separate. <laughs> we're not mathematicians. I mean, they may argue with me, but the fact that we deal with the human psyche and, the, and human emotion, we can't separate what we do with who we are. I, I'm, you know, we can't. It's a trait. It's, it's, you know, when other people look out a window, they look out a window. When we look out a window, we're cataloging everything, the mood, the color, the wind, the feel, because at some point we're going to conjure that back up. But that thing with, with balance I, is one of the toughest things in my career that I've always yeah. And so my next question is, and maybe this is related, is what are the challenges that you think are facing music education in the 21st century and how can we best meet them? Wow. I think there's a lot of challenges. <laughs> that are fair. I think the way we're training teachers, I have a real issue with. Um, we're doing it the same way we've always done it. Yet, you know, why is it we're losing a third of our of our teachers now every two years was the last I heard. Could it be that when those teachers graduate, they're not giving the right expectation of what they're going to see in the classroom? And whose responsibility is that? And I'm sorry, my university friends, that falls on us. Um, why aren't we addressing the three biggest reasons that music teachers lose their jobs, as an example, which is recruitment, uh, which is not being able to communicate clearly or effectively, whether it's presenting ourselves at a concert or talking at a board meeting, um, or it's our budget. So why don't music education programs require at least one semester of marketing, at least one semester of business, at least one semester of drama? You know, um, I think that's that's an issue. I think getting quality. And here's a scary one. I think getting quality people teaching music education. Um, I find it difficult to believe in my experience that the majority of people who want to teach music education are accepted. I just I find that astounding. And I think that. There's a difference between having a religious experience on the marching field my senior year and wanting to teach students. Those are two vastly different things. Um, for some people, music should remain a hobby because unless you have the heart of a child and the soul of a musician, you should never be in front of students teaching music. Um, and I think that's one of the challenges we have. You know, it kind of gets back to that how we're, how we're training teachers. But I also think we have got to realize, in my opinion, and this was one of the reasons I, I started the Music Gorilla, was that it's not going to be any edict from Washington, D.C. or any governing you know, music organization that's going to make a change. Every one of us that stands in front of a young musician has got to throw our lance into the ground and teach the absolute greatest we can teach and make the absolute biggest impact that we can have. Because if there's truly going to be a change in music education, it's not, in my opinion, going to start at the top. It's going to start with the best teachers in the classrooms now whatever we can do to become better teachers. Yes, we have to become active politically. Yes, we have to have a bigger voice, not only in our school, but in our community. Um, but we've got to start with being incredible teachers because I think in a lot of ways, we've brought some of the problems upon ourselves by the quality of what we do. Well, let me ask you this. And you know, you, you said a lot there, and a lot of that is on incumbent on the individual. But you did offer a criticism of music education and the way we train teachers. Yes, I did. And if you're okay with it, I'd like, do you have an idea about what your ideal music ed program would look like for a band director or for a choir director? Yeah. I mean, the, the way I perceive it, as I see it, is much more of, of an interactive process. Um, so, for example, if, and by the way, I know the argument that universities have is, listen, we're trying to keep the cost down and our curriculum is, okay, I, under, I understand all that. Doesn't mean it's right. I understand all that. But for example, I would like, I think we need to get students out into field experience much earlier, um, by and large, uh, wait until their junior year when they're vested, and then we send them out to have an extended experience. Come on, man. So I think that that's, that's got to be one thing that changes. I would like to see much more interaction between music classes. For example, maybe the orchestra director has selected repertoire. Well, is there a way that we can also use that repertoire in our theory classes? And then, and then in our conducting classes, we're using it here. And then our pedagogy classes come into that. 
why not reshape our pedagogy classes where we have students who are teaching the next students who are taking that class? Maybe the kids who just had our woodwind methods and have gone through that are now going to be the mentor teachers for the new kids in there so they can see what it's like to teach somebody. Well, that's, a, that's a terrific idea. Um, so combining all these things and giving our students much more, I'll say, lab type experiences where the courses work together and then really keeping an eye on what is current. I know this is tricky, but what are teachers really going to need? Example, if you look at what we teach in music education right now, most young music teachers that I talk to, when they get out, their biggest thing is, I never learned this. Why? Because 90% of what they learn is focused on when you're on the podium in front of your kids, right? What about the other 90% of stuff? <laughs> you know, how, how do you deal with parents? How about having some psychology courses that are, are more geared toward those kinds of relationships and students? Not just, you know, here's how students mature, but getting into more of the dynamics of that. Again, I mentioned about the marketing classes, learning how to promote our programs, how to promote ourselves, a drama class. How do you interact with people? One of the things that drives me nuts is when I see conductors who just don't know really how to present themselves to an audience. And, and that does such a discredit to the ensemble right off the bat. And the fact that, well, that's just the music teacher. Man, that's not an excuse. You know, that that's our pulpit that we've got to do. So in, in a nutshell, I think that I would like to see a way to make classes much more interactive with each other that create situations where our students are mentors to each other and are getting those teaching experiences early that require much more in the field of getting our students out. And here's a scary one. How about we, can, how about we quit using great music programs to place our student teachers in? <laughs> now, let me clarify that. No, I don't think I understand, but go ahead. Yeah. The majority of programs in our country are, are high schools, 400 students or less, just to use an example. The job that most students are going to get when they graduate, as you well know, is going to be in a school that is 400 students in the high school, total population or less. And you're either going to be replacing somebody that was fired or somebody that retired. It's difficult. And I understand we want to show our our. our our young teachers, what they can do. But when when we do that and they graduate and they go out and suddenly they've got a band of 20 and they're teaching a choir of 40 and they're doing general music and they're teaching something else, have we really equipped them well enough in a, in a, in a clinic situation where they know how to do that? Um, I think it's more important that we teach our students where to find the resources to be creative to succeed rather than giving them templates, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it makes perfect sense. Which kind of, to me, kind of feeds in. Um, but I also realize the challenges to that is, hey, man, we've been teaching the same way all these years. And, you know, conducting is, is one thing that kind of cracks me up, too. We spend more time conducting than anything else in front of a group. But yet, how much conducting training do we truly get? And of that conducting training, how much of it is really effective? Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I was just talking with a colleague about this. You know, I'm conducting a piece of mine coming up on a concert, and I was a high school band director for a few years, but I, I'm conducting isn't my thing. I don't consider that to be anything special. Yeah. And I had the normal training everyone else did, you know? I think conducting is our absolute, absolute best rehearsal tool. And I, you know, I used to challenge my, my conductors, the only time you want to stop a group is when you have to give pedagogical information which means you have to learn how to establish a, a, a rapport with that ensemble, a visual rapport, and that they understand what's going on. But also when I'm, when I'm saying conducting, I'm talking beyond the physical. I mean, really understanding what's going on in that score and what you want to, to pull from in any given rehearsal, which also you know, establishes your, your lesson plan. Now, the, now, the artistic decisions that you're going to make at a higher level are going to be much different. And, and of course, chances are with the players. But I think the approach theoretically, is the same. Um, I was just in Zambia doing a workshop in Lusaka, and it was kind of funny because one of the things that, that they brought up was they wanted to do some conducting. So I started getting into explaining conducting, and, the, and you know, there's the physical part of it, there's the research part of it, and there's the personal part of it. And as we started to get into this, they were kind of astounded to find out, oh, it's not just floor, door, window, ceiling. You know, there's score analysis involved, and then there's 
you know, informed intuition and there's looking at possible problem areas and there's understanding harmonically why does a composer doing this and I mean all these different kinds of things. And I think that those those come to bear at at, at any level. No, I would agree a hundred percent. All those other things are more important than the actual physical. I mean, I've seen conductors who were amazing with the baton and I've seen conductors who just beat time, who can get the same out of the group if they're effective with how they're teaching the music. Well, you know, uh, uh, a galvanizing time in my career, I was selected as a, as a, a conducting fellow for the Eastern Wind Ensemble's 40th anniversary. And so I'm, I'll never forget this. On the stage was Fred Finnell and E. Clyde Roller, who nobody knows because he followed Fred Finnell. And then Don Hunsberg. You never want to be the guy who follows the legend. You want to be the guy who follows the guy who follows the legend or the person. That's, that's right. And that's why they waited on Hunsberg. But um, I, I won't bore you with the whole story because the whole thing ended up pretty humorous. But the, the gist of the situation was, you know, I'd practiced, I practiced. I knew everything in that score, every right, every note, every dynamic, every, you know, thing. And at that time, Eastman was just, they were the group. And I remember standing in front of them realizing, oh, my God they can play all the right notes and all the right dynamics and all the articulations and everything else. Mm. And that's when it truly struck me of what yeah. else do I have to bring to the equation? But yeah. the kick is, even if we approach our young groups with that philosophy, right? What else are we going to bring to it? That has a way of bringing everything else, the import of everything else up. This is why we have to have the right notes. This is why these things fall in place. Because this helps create this higher communication that we're after and what we want the audience to experience. Yeah, you know, you're right. So how do we get better at conducting? Let's say we're in our job, we're teaching, we've been there a few years and we're, we're away from the university. How do you get better? One of the ways is, is to try to watch. That's one of the easiest ways. I mean, you know, get online. Don't look at, don't look at videos of people conducting performances. Look up rehearsals. Look at how they respond in rehearsal. Um, there's a myriad of textbooks that are out there. There's always conducting symposiums somewhere. But in terms of actually making it happen, there's various exercises that you can do in the warm-ups with your group that help establish a visual communication. And, and the nuts and bolts of it to make it happen, that's a great place for it to start, is rather than kicking off a tempo and having them burn through a scale where they're not using their ears, the warm-up is not to warm the horns up. The warm-up is to warm up the ears and the eyes. And that's one of the best places we can start to really get picky about our conducting because it allows us as the conductor to really look, for example, at the size of our pattern or the nuance of our wrist or the mechanics that we're doing. And then our students see out of musical context, this is what, for example, a mancata looks like. That's what legato is going to look like. This is what, you know, mezzo forte is going to be kind of things. And videotape. I, I hate videotaping myself. That's one of the best ways. Just pull up a bucket, get ready to throw up in it, watch yourself a little bit, throw up a little bit more, watch yourself a little bit more. <laughs> I know it's hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you're right. You know, I, I, yeah, no, you're right. So what advice would you give your younger self, maybe your 20 year old self just starting out? Man, slow down. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it doesn't have to happen in a couple of years. I think that's one of the biggest things. I, I appreciated the fact when I look back that I always went after everything. But um, I think I would tell myself to slow down a little bit. I think there are some things I would, I would tell myself to take more chances. Um, uh, you know, those were, and look at balance very earlier. Not everything is as you believe, you know. Um, I, I spent a lot of my life chasing a paradigm that I realized was smoke, you know. Um, so finding that niche it's hard to run your own race, you know? Sure, sure, absolutely. So I used to ask this as what's your favorite work for Wind Ensemble, but I've since changed to if you had one last piece to conduct, what would be the last piece you'd want to conduct? I can't even answer that. I, You know, whatever it would be would be fine. You know, I used to be able to rip off a list for you and just say, well, it'd be this piece and this piece, Mark, and it would be this piece and the nuance. Of, I just can't do it anymore. I mean, I just... You know, I, I, I love wrapping myself around the score and becoming that composer, t attempting to, and transporting to that place. And every time I look at a piece of music, it's, I'm, in a, I'm, I'm walking through a portal. I mean, it's just such the coolest experience. It doesn't matter what the piece is. And I think, for me, that's part of the rush and going on that journey with whatever that particular music happens to be. And, it, it, you know, that, that to me is, 
that to me is the art of it. It's not, it's not so much the piece, although that's the medium through which it happens. It's the combined experience of all that happening at once. All right. I'll let you off the hook, Milt. <laughs> I just saw it. That's all right. That's all right. So we talked about mu- Music Gorilla, but is there anything you'd like to share or promote? Would you like to speak more about that program? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, the, the Music Gorilla, and the spelling for that is G-U-E-R-R-I-L-L-A, uh, www.themusicgorilla.com. Um, again, part of the basis of that is just a, a access to, to clinics and a kind of a different way of, of doing things. Um, again, I'd mentioned the cross curricular things early, but uh, a big part of that is I'm constantly looking for, for programs that are underserviced or underfunded. Um, currently, we just started a new uh, partnership program I'm really excited about called M2P, the Music Partner Program. Um, and essentially what I'm trying to do is find one school, uh, or organization that will pair with one of the 11 groups, uh, that I currently have on the docket. And the idea is, uh, that whoever that paired group is, it's a good faith commitment. Try to raise funds, uh, have, have an accessories drive, um, that we can give to this school, um, or at least will help in some way, even help me get to those schools to do clinics and those kinds of things. And currently we have, um, gosh, I got to think, is it five, five schools, six schools, five schools, I believe in Africa, uh, four in Rwanda and, uh, one in Zambia and five schools in Haiti and then Compton, California, Centennial High School, um, is, is on there as well and hoping to expand, but there's no border play for this. It's very different. I'm not advertising. We're not getting any kind of industry support or anything. I really am approaching this as a grassroots thing. I'm, I'm, it purposely eliminates the middleman. So um, right now it's just me. I eventually hope to expand and get other teachers on board that I can, I can send out to things. But, but for right now, um, I would encourage anybody to take a look at it. And if there's any way we may be of service, or better yet, if there's a school out there that would like a really cool partnership for a year, um, uh, uh, the information's on the website, and it'd be a very cool thing. I mean, it, it's just, and these programs, one of the reasons that I'm doing it there is I've never in a situation seen uh, where music literally saved lives, uh, and I have in these places, and it's, it's life-changing. Uh, so... But yeah, any kind of help. I want to encourage people to do that and, you know, throw a couple bucks our way. You know, I mean, these folks. Well, I'll definitely put up a link on the, um, on the episode and I'll make sure that, that, that people know about it. What would a partnership look like if I were a high school director? The, the partnership is so non red tape. It almost looks like, okay, what do I do? So essentially what the partnership is with, with the, the initial 11 is, you simply make a commitment that says, okay, we're going to, we're going to have a fundraiser, maybe a pass the hat at a concert, or maybe we'll have a dedicated fundraiser. Maybe we'll sell M&Ms or whatever it is. Uh, maybe we'll have an accessories drive. And essentially that school will work through me in getting those things to that, that school. Now, the reason we're using the music gorilla as a kind of a funnel for this rather than direct contact, um, when you're dealing with some programs, you can get into some interesting dynamics. And these are programs that I know, and it just works a little bit better if, you know, we kind of work through the Music Gorilla Foundation, which then works with these groups. Also, depending on the school, there's specific needs. Um, for example, I'm coming back from uh, Lusaka. There's, there's certain educational needs. I mean, just some, some literature and some books and things that specifically I know they need. Well, that's something that a partner school may be able to help provide through a, through a fundraiser kind of thing or you know, raising funds or again, a pass the hat kind of thing. So it's really very, very simple. There's nothing in writing. There's no signed contract. I'm, I'm truly looking at this as a, as a very altruistic, give us your best shot kind of thing for, for a year. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Are you coming to Midwest? Uh, no, I'm not. This has been a terrific interview, Milt. Oh, thanks. Yeah. You make me want to practice my conducting. You make me want to reshape music education. And more, <laughs> most importantly, I want to go into a classroom like right now. Uh, yes. so, <laughs> it was a great interview. I appreciate it. Oh man. It's my, I really appreciate you hollering at me. Sure. So how can people get in touch with you? Uh, easiest way. I mean, you can, you can message me, uh, through the, either the website, the music website or message through Facebook, which is Dr. What's my name? Dr. Milt Allen, I think is no period on the Facebook. You can also access that through the music gorilla. 
but also even just milt at miltallen.com, M-I-L-T-A-L-L-E-N.com. Great. Well, thanks so much, Milt. Absolutely. It's been my pleasure. Well, mine too. Thanks so much. 